Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. A pleasure. Hello, welcome. Hello, Joe. How are you? I am so excited. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this with me. Do you know why you're here? Because uh, I do, but maybe you don't. I didn't do it. I'm innocent. You're here because you're a musician. Maybe one of the main things about you. Tell everybody your name. My name is Brian Viglione. What instrument do you play, Brian? I play several instruments, the primary instrument being the drums. I grew up also playing guitar and bass by virtue of the fact that I had the drum kit at my house and all my friends would leave their stuff at my house. So I would tinker and noodle and eventually branched out. When did you start playing drums? I started playing in earnest when I was about eight. What first drew you to playing the drums? Uh, it was like Christmas when I was four years old. My dad got me a drum kit, a little Muppet drum kit, which I wish I hadn't destroyed with pins when I was a small child. I must have been into a John Cage experimental music thing at that time. Okay. I don't really know because what I did was took my mom's pin cushion and stuck pins into the front bass drum head because it made this kind of cool like like the piercing sound. That got destroyed, unfortunately. But then my dad got me a kit when I was about six. And this drum kit I actually had, and it still is in existence at his place, but I play that in bands like all into my adulthood. He tried to give me more formal lessons when I was about, you know, six or seven years old, but I was just still at the age where I didn't want to sort of sit and focus and do a lot of mechanical exercises. So I set that down. I really dug in when I was about eight or nine. That's when I found a deep calling that has never wavered. How did you feel the first time you sat down and played at a drum kit? I remember the first time that playing a drum kit made a huge impression on me. Okay. I'll say that. There was a moment, I remember where my drums were set up in my room. I hadn't touched this drum kit for about a year and a half or so. It was really just kind of sitting there. And then one day I remember it kind of caught my eye and I sort of sat down and I started playing a pattern where I was like playing the snare drum and the rack time. I was going like as fast as I can. And that moment, I remember like, I was like, wow, that sounds cool. Like, this is like fun. And I like the like energy burst of it. And I like just the, the power that came out of the sound. Kids probably don't struggle with it as much, but what I was experiencing was one of the most beautiful and liberating aspects of playing music is that just makes you totally present. Mm. And that was a really impactful moment. Your dad got you the kit, so did your dad play? Yeah, my dad did play. He, as a teenager in the 1960s, grew up loving all the drummers of that era of both like rock and jazz. He started playing when he was about 15 and was in a band called Condor. They played at their big battle of the bands at Ridgewood High School for like 3,000 kids and won. But my grandmother, being the very sort of pragmatic World War II generation, was like, you're not going to be a musician, go get a real job, and I'm making you sell your drum kit, which was devastating. Oh, my dad had to, like, sell off all his gear at that time and started working construction with his uncle and then pursued his life path of, of going into carpentry and building, but maintain this deep love of drumming and music. I have to really give my father a lot of credit in the sense that he wasn't like this overbearing sort of satellite activities dad that forced it on me in any kind of way. Both my parents too, like loved music and were very supportive of my drumming. My dad is just the one who had the kind of, he had the real spotlight on drumming and instruments itself. Whereas my mother too was very encouraging to like, life is this beautiful gift and be whoever you want to be and you know, feel free to you know, explore those things and see what speaks to you. The combination of that kind of parental guidance definitely set me on a path towards being open to doing music and exploring that kind of creative voice. My dad really was like, use the drums as an instrument to express and further your own voice in the world. He was really good about presenting me with all kinds of stimulating material, whether it was like, you know, throwing a Led Zeppelin record on in the living room and cranking up the stereo and just pointing out, you know, beats that John Bonham was doing. He brought me to see Elvin Jones. It was, I think, February 13th, 1990 at the Regatta Bar in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Seeing this man when I was 11, absolutely transformative too. Seeing that type of spirit and soul and passion 
expressed through an instrument and with a group of people like that, that really set a tone for me. And Elvin would come through on tour every spring and do week-long residency there. That started a tradition for me. I moved to Boston when I was 20 and would go back and bring my friends and save up my money for my little minimum wage job and like buy as many tickets to go see him play and watching the way that this man would interact with fans of his, having that experience brought to me by my father who was like, you need to have this in your life. So rather than my dad basically kind of breathing down my neck, he would be like, check this out. My dad just really struck the right balance with allowing me to do my own thing and explore, but really taking a hand in shaping the whole ethos that I applied to music itself and performing and collaboration and learning and, and developing. You said a lot about your dad supporting you. What about your mom? Do you feel like your mom was also very much like, do this, get into this, and supportive? Uh, it was not as much a direct push, but more allowing and encouraging. She just had like this incredible balance of, you know, letting me make a, a ruckus, you know, for all of these years. So you've like basically been nurtured to be a musician. They saw the passion and they wanted to keep that going. And then it was only later on, actually, that I realized part of the, uh, the musical identity. I found myself in, you know, being able to bond with my instrument in my bedroom when the chips were down. The drums actually became a conduit for me to really maintain a meaningful relationship with my father. When my parents divorced, he had bought himself um, a 1987 Thomas Swingstar drum kit. And he'd played it, you know, for several years. But then when he moved officially in 1993, he was like, son, I'm gonna give you my drums. And I was like, <gasps> you know, it was like a very heavy father-son, like I'm leaving, but take my drums, do good things with them, and I'll always be with you kind of yeah. feeling. So the combination of finding an instrument to kind of use as a way of processing emotional stress, but then also maintaining a relationship with my father who now moved you know, several hundred miles away, and then finding my own voice within that, that was sort of like the magic trifecta that cemented drums and music as the foundation point for my life and my identity. Oh, and then only further compounded by the fact that when I got into junior high, seeing how excited my friends got when we'd have all jam sessions and play at parties, I was like, I wanna do this and I know how deeply music has saved my life. This is for sure something I wanna pursue. So you'd say you've known for a long time that you were gonna do music. Like yeah. you felt it since a young age. Yes, and I just became an avid reader of like, Hit Parader and Circus and Metal Edge and Rolling Stone and Spin and like all the f***ing <laughs> magazines. Rather than getting into baseball cards or, or comic books, I just completely absorbed myself into the world of rock and roll and heavy metal. And then I had like a pod of friends too where that was like our life and we used to strut around recess <laughs> in fourth grade with this boombox cranking like 80s metal. Third grade we had a little party and I brought in a copy of Hysteria by Def Leppard. And I was like, can we please play this? And like cranking it and having I mean, like, you know, pizza and like orange aid and whatever and stuff like that. And just be like, you know. When I moved up to the middle school, I met a whole new group of kids, one of which being a uh, guy named uh, Casey Donovan, who became, you know, again, another just like lifelong friend. I did so much learning and developing with this little fifth grade kid. We met in shop class, immediately decided that we would be a band and started writing songs. The whole path of beginning to start a band. And back to my mother being supportive, like my house became the hub, the rock club, the office, the congregation spot where like scads of friends would come over like on weekends or during the summer vacations and stuff like that. And we would just be playing all day. And then, you know, by the time seventh grade, more and more concerted effort on like writing songs and playing and then we got asked to perform at our middle school in front of the whole auditorium. That was like a mind shaking moment. We played I Remember You by Skid Row and Enter Sandman. The drummer for his brother's band Rob came up and started like head banging at the front of the stage like sort of like wow. in solidarity when we played at the high school. That one small act of like this like high school senior. I remember that being a real sort of confidence booster of like yeah. awesome. That's the approval you need in high school is the senior guy to be like. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Props to Mom Viglione here too. Also, like I remember one one of the funny things we used to laugh about was always a factor when she'd have to get a new car. 
it would be like, can it fit the drums? She was great about getting me to and from all the little various activities that I was doing. I played with any number of different people around our community back then. Late 80s, there was a lot of hoopla through the media about like the dangers of heavy metal yeah. and mom got kind of spooked. I brought home the live minor threat video from the 930 club, they had like a live concert tape. And her just like shaking her head at me going like, what do you hear in this music? What I heard in all of that music is what informed like A, a really intense work ethic, a super um, dedication to believing in myself and the mission that I was on and the life skills needed to actually execute a band. My mom took a huge leap of faith to trust that I was doing this for like reasons that would be productive and additive to my life rather than self destruct We have learned a lot about you uh, in your very early getting to know yourself mm -hmm. as a drummer, right? Like, and also a musician. I mean, you, you really focused on drums, but you said you played other instruments. Yeah, you know, it's funny too, because a lot of the guitar and bass stuff was concurrent with that early uh, you know, drumming that I was doing too. I just wanted to learn all of it. I would learn a song on like all three instruments. I got my first electric guitar, this black Washburn, when I was 13, I think for my 13th birthday. You know, I used to play my friend Casey's bass. Do you think it also helped you to know what the bass and guitar are doing? Does that hone your skills as a drummer? That abs, yes. And I got actually a huge dose of that when I moved to Boston, joined this band and played drums. However, the singer of the band was like, yeah, I got us a gig, but I've hired my friend to play drums, so you're going to play bass. And I wound up staying on bass for a year and a half. Definitely not what I signed up for in that major life transition. But the biggest experience that came from it was learning to play the other like sort of main rhythm section instrument. And that made me a much more sort of attenuated drummer. You play for some bands. Just holding my fangirl down here about the fact that you are the drummer for Dresden Dolls. Yes. And just, just, just <laughs> chill. <laughs> this is the moment we've been waiting for. Excuse me, I'm just talking <laughs> about... Thanks for coming too. <laughs> you, you play for Dresden Dolls. It is your band. Mm -hmm. The style of music, to me, it feels like pure creativity coming from all of that influence, all that experience you had... How did that happen? Um, in, a, in a sort of, in a nutshell, how it happened was two young weirdos positioning themselves in a city with the musical resources to pursue their dream. You have to, when you have the burning desire to do X, you need to go to the places where you can facilitate, period. So I knew that I wanted to do that. I moved to Boston when I was 20. I met Amanda when I was 21. Finding and seeking out your place and your people and when you realize that you've got something very special, then you need to put in the hard work and dedication and the commitment. Commitment is paramount to everything. I met Amanda on Halloween of 2000 in that top floor of her crazy house at the Cloud Club, surrounded by maybe 20 other people sitting on the floor as she was banging out these incredibly unique songs on this little spinet piano. I had that like cinematic, you know, cliche moment of epiphany where it's just like oh my god but it was like i like saw the band flash before my eyes watching this young woman play these intense songs i just thought to myself like i've never heard lyrics like this i've never seen anyone play piano like this but i absolutely know what to do with this music immediately just was like wanting to answer the call i sort of just went up to her i said i really loved your music I play drums. If you ever like to get together, like here's my number. And a week wow. later, as she came to the rehearsal space, kind of awkward first date thing of like, uh, so yeah, you know, but you're also burying your soul with this music that you've been writing. She started playing the intro riff to the song Sex Changes, started listening and started just intuitively started picking up and playing this kind of drum cadence along with it. And she sort of stopped and looked up awkwardly. And I was like, I was like oh, is, that, is that cool? Like, do, do you like what I'm doing? Is that all right? Like, and she goes, yeah, I can tell this is going to be good. At the end of that night, we were like holding hands, jumping up and down, like going like, let's be a band, let's be a band, Wee! But what that excitement was, was like the two mutual souls recognizing, you understand me. Mm. And that's what we had. We would set up a rehearsal schedule of four to six hours a day, four days a week. Wow. 
it was not like a f around once like two hours for like one day a week lots of playing time together and the fun thing was in the early days um, you had sort of asked me uh, earlier off camera if I'd ever had the sort of experience of kind of like uh, like making love to my instrument well this was the closest thing that I'd really ever had to the experience of sort of like making musical love with somebody because of again like you think of the element is not just sort of a sensational flashiness or sex appeal it's real communion with somebody mm -hmm. at yeah. its core Absolutely. responding to your partner musical or otherwise we would set up facing each other in her like little bedroom at her little keyboard and my drums just two feet away and she would just play and express and improvise on the piano and or I would start a beat and she would follow along and it was just literally like musical love making where following each other listening and responding and like in infusing that with like all the passion that really is what gave the Dresden Dolls its thrust which drum kit were you playing the drum kit that I first played with Amanda was the drum kit my dad bought me when I was six I wound up bringing down the red Tama swing star kit that my father gave me when I was 13. Mm. Then that became the main Dresden Dolls kit for uh, until 2005. So Dresden Dolls is your, your baby, your band, you and Amanda still do some things. Would you like to just share a little bit about the other groups you've been part of, either yeah. on tour or recorded for? Well, uh, two of the, the larger groups that I played for uh, were Violent Femmes. Um, that was an exceptionally exciting time. I was a huge fan of those guys, you know, when I was in high school. Played in that band for about two and a half years, did two records with them, loads of touring around the world. And then in 2007 and 8, I had recorded with Nine Inch Nails for The Ghosts 1 through 4. That was an era when Trent Reznor was experimenting and sort of broadening the scope of what he could do with Nine Inch Nails. When I arrived at his house for the first day of recording, he said, well, I thought a fun art project for the day would be to have you build a drum kit out of whatever found material you want, and then we'll record tonight. So I formulated this drum kit and went off with his assistant, Brett, and you know got a few snare drum stands and a kick drum and then a huge galvanized trash can and a bunch of like aluminum pipes and sheet metal things and wood dowels and water jugs and built this like crazy drum kit that later that evening, they just put the headphones on me and said, we're gonna give you a tempo, play whatever comes into your head. Try not to make it sound like a, like a hippie drum circle, but just, you know. <laughs> and then aside from that, there's been a slew of other bands, very impactful just in my life in terms of a collaboration. Uh, the World Inferno Friendship Society from New York, Human Wine from, from Boston, Morning Glory, currently Radiator King, Kaylin Chase, our, our good friend, Casey Lansdale uh, here in Los Angeles, uh, numerous, numerous other, other bands and artists over the years, but always a very exciting, broad spectrum of styles. Yeah. One of the things that hasn't happened to me is that I feel like I've gotten pigeonholed into only playing with sort of like punk cabaret bands. Yeah. Really blessed to play with all these different people, for yeah. sure. You really feel like the kind of drummer that can adapt just to whatever the, serves the music. Also, I mean, I like a very broad swath of musical styles. Everything from reggae to opera to experimental and electronic. I'm more driven by what stimulates me artistically. And I was taught to just always have an open mind, Absolutely. always be listening, because you can learn something from, from everybody. Yeah. on the flourish something that is our main focus is a particular instrument i usually will say to please bring one of the uh, souls in your life to share with us and in this instance it's not a physical possibility to have the instrument here but i do want to ask you about what instrument you would have brought had it been physically possible and then how did you acquire the instrument and why did you choose it of all of the choices you had Absolutely. That would be the instrument which carries maybe the most recent of sentimental meaning and attachment for me. Because there are really four drum kits, all of which have been majorly connected to my life. But the Yamaha Oak custom drum kit that I bought in 2005 when the Dresden Dolls got signed to Roadrunner and we got our record advance, we were able to finally get ourselves like some new gear. I went to one of my favorite places ever, Jack's Drum Shop in Boston, and the guy Greg who worked there, he had known me since I was just like a little pipsqueak coming in there 
you know, buying sticks and drum heads and things like that, all through like the sort of local rise of Dresden Dolls. He was a real buddy to me. He was really the one that suggested the drum kit to me. I went in there and told him that like, we've just got our advance and I want to buy a new drum kit. Here's what I, I was like, I want a kit. I would like something in sort of a natural wood finish. I want something that really sings and I can play in a very musical way. He's like, I'm going to tell you about this drum kit. They're beautiful and it's exactly what you're describing. I don't have one in the shop yet, but I can I can order it for you. And trust me on this, this is, I think, what you're exactly like you're looking for. And I was like, great, order it up. I couldn't have been happier. It was absolutely what I was hoping for and more. He was spot on correct. I had up until that point not played a set of drums where the shells responded to that degree that I was wanting for. They're much different than like a recording kit where the response is very sort of short, quick, dead, tight. Mm. I wanted something that would really be able to sing out because of what I was doing in the approach in Dresden Dolls was to play in a more orchestrative manner. And we were only a duo. I had a lot more room and I found that I was playing a lot of mallets. These particular shells responded beautifully to mallet playing where I could sort of like get them tuned really nice, mm. play them very gently. And they have that almost kind of like sort of like, like a timpani kind of response. Those drums came with us on like the most hardcore of the hardcore years of our touring. Those drums were just there every night in one of the most hardcore, you know, eras of my entire life. At that point, I felt like I was kind of at the butt end of some weird existential joke where here I was getting the main meat and potatoes of like the dream I had pursued and wanted since I was a little kid, yet the context was uh, extremely stressful. And the gift of having an instrument that I could at least feel that connected with on a night-to-night -night basic in the context of making this music, whether it was a, sort of a stressful environment or just a, like absolute unhindered bliss on stage, to have something, the, the instrument feel that personally connected to you in those moments of creation was incredible. And, you know, I, I was really lucky to have those drums and they'll always be like that kit something that i feel you know deeply connected with the way you describe how you got it did you essentially you bought it sight unseen like you yes. just trusted this guy you didn't actually yep. play it yet right you... no i heard a single note out of beat out of it i told him what i was looking for yeah. he his eyes got big and he was like yeah i think i have the kit just for he you knew. it was just like built like a rock and sounded great and still sounds great so yeah are you familiar with Harry Potter? Mm -hmm. And so my feelings about the author aside, there is this thing in Harry Potter where they go to a specific shop to get their wands. <laughs> totally is. Especially with these tiny shops, these like, you know, Mike's music, you know, like these tiny little shops especially, I really feel like it's going to find your wand. Yes. And the wand singing. chooses the wizard, Mr. Potter. Yeah, it's, yes. it feels like that. So Greg, to me, feels like that character. He was the Ollivander. You know? He was the... He was the <laughs> you need to take your Ollivanders and get a drum set, Harry. Yeah. yeah. One of the other things that you need is functionality out of a kit and you need to also out of any instrument and you need to have an instrument mm. that inspires you to play and I've heard guitar players too talk at length about like you know the color of a guitar or just like you know there's yeah. something that will speak to you about it yeah. visually this thing was what I wanted and what I had been envisioning it was even more the fact that I knew this thing could like take a beating and keep yeah. on going and that it produced the musical qualities that I so was completely set on Something that it's you know maybe you sit in this particular car and ah, maybe purrs or whatever like that and you just like it everything feels right it feels like an extension of you and it delivers beyond what you could imagine in terms of like its musical ability and response responsiveness and that's one of the sort of the fun things about experimenting with various instruments is that because then you too and it's like I, and I like the Harry Potter analogy about the different wands because yeah maybe you have a particular drum kit but like this L maybe you have like smaller dimensions or like maybe it's like maybe it's not unicorn hair but dragon bristle or whatever the hell like you just get certain things that will then draw a different side of you out mm. I've had that experience playing vintage drum kits in recording studios for particular albums. Yeah. And you might sit down to like a 1930s Rogers kit and have a totally different element come out. It's nice to have the options where various facets of your expression can come out. What 
could I possibly tell you that I haven't already told you? Actually, there is a little bit more you can tell me, and I love it. That The explanation of your drum kit that you chose today, the Yamaha, is fantastic. It's especially interesting for me because it's the first time that somebody has picked an instrument that they got and they didn't sit and play and feel it first. Have you done that where you've like gone to a place and just spent a lot of time with a lot of different instruments and even the exact same model but like you go over here and you play this one you're like no but it's this one yes absolutely that's my symbols and i love I like listening to all the different nuances and varieties of of symbols that are out there too because those also too are so expressive depending on like even what type of stick you play it with the materials that you're working with have a huge influence on the sound that comes out I was very fortunate. The time I lived in Boston, I lived just about 45 minutes away from the Zildjian factory. Going to the showroom there was always an exciting sort of exploration about whatever new products they had out. I used to take 10 of the same model and go through, put them on stands and test them and be like, they could all sound wildly different. That even with the same, the same range of product that you play. So it's finding that one that you go like, yep. That's the one that speaks to me. And working with companies, A, that where you trust the consistency of the things that they make. Shout out all of my sponsors of Yamaha Drums, Vic Firth, Drumsticks, and Zildjian Cymbals, who I've been proudly on those teams since 2004 and five. Wow, right. Yep. Is there something about this kit in particular that made you choose it to talk about today when I asked you to pick an instrument? It had probably the most personal significance in my adult life. I could talk at length about the other two drum kits too. This is the most recent and relevant mm -hmm. one to my sort of, you know, my, my drumming with the, my band and touring in the throes of living out my dream. That drum kit was there and was the, the instrument that I was able to do that with. Is it something that like kind of symbolized, wow, I made it or something like that? Does it mean something in that sense? No, not really. It wasn't like a, wow, we made it. It's like, you know, if you're a chef and you're at chef school and your knife goes dull, man, you need to fucking get another one and you need to get like a good one and one that's going to last you, not one that you can take care of. So it's not about prestige. It's just about going like, this is, this is mine. I will take care of it, guard it and use it for fight for the powers of good. We're going to have pictures, but can you tell me what color it is? Yes, it is sort of a um, natural wood grain finish on the sort of reddish brown sort of color spectrum. I just thought it was very beautiful, like the natural wood grains. And I, I knew I didn't want like another sort of like lacquer finish, but like the, uh, the sort of like a sparkle kit or like a tortoise shell or something in that kind of vein. I just I wanted like the natural sort of hues of the wood to kind of poke through. And I just thought it was like a very beautiful kind of tone. Again, it was just something that sort of for me spoke to me personally, inspired me to want to want to play. You have to feel that attraction to the instrument. And then you the thing to like want to like touch it and caress it and like play it and explore its whole body and see what comes from that relationship. Like an instrument that's aesthetically beautiful to you as well. It helps you feel again, it's like part of like having that connection to the instrument. Yeah, the chemistry is, you know, how we use it with humans, where like we have a chemistry with each other, but it yeah. really happens with the things that we surround ourselves with too. Very much. And especially with something that is being used as a tool mm -hmm. to express your emotions and also possibly embody other people's emotions and to communicate with other people. And yeah. So every factor matters. You know, you want to say looks don't matter, but looks matter. I mean, you want it to, you want to look good with it. You want it to look good with you. You want it to look good on stage, yeah. right? Like exactly. all those things make a difference. For sure. And of course, then at the end of the day, if it sounds like crap, it doesn't matter how it looks. But mm -hmm. if you can have all of those things together, I mean, it's- Oh, it's you know, the best, yeah. You get your, sure. your relationship instrument. <laughs> particular drum actually even with any drum but with this particular kit does mm. sitting down to play it change your mood yes absolutely unequivocally playing drums is a massive part of my <laughs> maintaining my general mental health from being a young kid where I realized very early it was a great means to like blow off steam and massive amounts of stress and having music and drumming absolutely 1000% saved my life. On top of that, multiply the amount of joy that I was able to experience. The more people that you reach, the more lives that you touch, the more joy, even if it's just for a brief time, 
that that feels like it makes the world a better place. It makes your own personal experience in life more joyful and connected. The main reason I wanted to do music as a profession. It's important, I think, for me to say this in tying in with the instrument and the love of playing and what it did for me. There was a moment in my sort of early or mid-teen years where I kind of had this sort of like solemn, sacred kind of communion where I said like, I what I want to do with this is to be a part of the musical continuum. If I could be an artist like those who have helped me in my life, I want to contribute and be a part to keep that going and be that person who makes some kid's life a little easier and a little better. That's what wound up transpiring to a huge degree, in particular with the Dresden Dolls. Yeah. So I was ex exceptionally thankful for that because the act of playing drums was doing that for me in my life. Connecting me to like some higher thing, some higher force. That's what I was feeling potently. This is something deeply sacred to me that I want to nurture and protect and like let flourish. That's the kind of longevity and sort of legacy that to me is really inspiring because it constantly gives back. I want to f rip like until I can't anymore. I mean, then I'll still be like fighting in the hospital. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Like that's just, Life's tough enough as it is. Like when you get something that like means something, they have to keep it and protect it, nurture it. Yeah. And if you can take it a step further and if you have any ability to teach and inspire, help other people learn to do that for themselves. Yeah. And then it becomes this self-perpetuating ripple effect. And even just in the act of doing this so publicly. So mm -hmm. you don't even have to literally go up and hand somebody like a, here's a pick, here's a drumstick. Yeah. Go, go try those out, see how you feel. It's just being and allowing yourself to be so fully exposed and vulnerable to them. Mm -hmm. You go up on stage and give it your all, giving it your all literally means, yeah. like just let the, let everything out on the stage, let everything come out and just be, yeah. and somebody will see it, yeah. feel the influence of it. And in addition to this, you do the teaching you said that you do, and mm -hmm. you are literally like able to tell people, if you love this, if you wanna keep this, just do it. You need to have dedication for any kind of thing yeah. if you wanna like make an impact with your work. Is there any particular moment with the Yamaha kit that stands out in your mind, like any show or any like bizarre occurrence or really bad experience or whatever, anything mm. uh, that stands out to you in your memory with that kit? It would be difficult to maybe pinpoint a particular show, that era itself was just such a giant roller coaster ride and that drum kit was just such a friend to me day to day. There are certain moments, for example, like I mentioned before, the uh, the, Dresden, the Paradise DVD with the Dresden Dolls. Mm -hmm. You know, the sense that this was going to be going down for posterity. I think the real sense of purpose that I felt in that particular performance that night was very meaningful. Also, the recording of our second album, Yes, Virginia. We recorded at Allaire Studios in upstate New York. It was such an incredibly beautiful studio. And to hear my drums sort of sing out in that beautiful kind of cathedral-like space, making this record where I really was like, I am going to give everything. And I didn't leave the space for uh, the full 11 days that we were there. Looking back and seeing the photos of that drum kit there with me at that point and going like, all right, it's you and me. And, you know, moments late at night where I would just be playing and just for the enjoyment of playing even during the recording session while we were working all day. Now, there's a, a significant bond with that instrument and what I was going through and what that instrument helped me process. I like how you called it your friend. Yeah. It is my friend. Mm -hmm. My instruments are all my lovers, really. To friends and lovers. Kit is not here, hmm? but we didn't tell anybody why. Why is the kit not here? The kit is not here because it is at the ready and able to go for whatever the next Dresden Dolls round of touring would be. That is at the storage space in New York State. Hopefully we will get to use them as soon as we can. How does it make you feel knowing that those instruments are sitting in storage? Good. 
I would rather know that they're they're sitting in storage than not and you know that I had to sell them or something at, yet at the same token it's it's just like Yes, my pet. Be patient. We will be re reunited soon. You know these things that you want to play are sitting there, just like call, like calling to you. So you miss them a little bit. It's just that you, you know, just a touch. Yeah. Oh, I mean, if they were like like been exploded in some kind of like volcanic eruption or something like that, it'd be like, uh. Do you have any names for your instruments? Do you ever give them any like proper names? No. I guess because I don't see it as an external thing, mm. actually. I don't, I don't think about it like that. I just sort of sit down at the drums and they're this living, breathing thing that sort of transcends like a name and like an identity, I guess. Do you have a website? We do, dresdendolls.com. And then I have a brianviglione.com. Yep, those will be down there so you don't have to worry about the spelling. It's got all, all of it's in the description below. As well as places to follow on social media. Where can we follow you on social media? I'm on Instagram at, at Brian Viglione and uh, Facebook, Brian Viglione Music. And you also know me, I am I Nene, and you can follow me at I am I Nene in all the places, and I'll put all those down there. If you have not yet, I would love if you would subscribe to this channel because I love talking to musicians about stuff and if you subscribe, more of them will say yes. That's right. That's, <laughs> Thank that's you right. so, so much. Thank you for I'm having me. so glad. Life uh, fulfillment's going on, being able to, to do this with you. And also, being able to record with you has been really cool. Look out for my music with this gentleman on some drums. We're going to have some stuff out there. Joe Nagel Music. JoeNagel.com. Yes. It's beautiful. I enjoyed it. Thank you for having me play drums with you. It was amazing. Thank you. Any of you who are following my channel, you may know that I started taking up an interest in playing drums recently. Um, that's not why I picked a drummer. I picked a drummer because I have not yet had a drummer on this. At the end, we usually do a live uh, little song and that's kind of hard to capture with the equipment I've got. And in this instance, we could not use the instrument itself. So instead, we have a super cool, super special treat to showcase this particular Yamaha that Brian's been telling us about. What is this clip we're gonna be showing them? So this is the uh, clip of the song Half Jack by the Dresden Dolls from our Paradise Live DVD filmed in Boston in 2005. This song in particular was always improvised in the introduction section, which is a sort of gradual build between the drums and piano in this kind of musical conversation. And uh, this particular night had extra significance. And um, we're, you know, it was a, a, definitely a moment that will live on in Dresden Dolls' memory for a long time. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful night, evening, day, tomorrow, yesterday, whatever it may be for you. And we'll talk to you later. Enjoy Dresden Dolls. Enjoy them. Thank you.